UFC 237 from Rio de Janeiro and uh, I guess no great surprise that there are a lot of Brazilians on the card and as we do for all the UFC pay-per-view, Dan Hooker has come in in his UFC t-shirt. Uh, My free UFC gears. Yeah. <laughs> and whenever you come into the studio, go, it's a good card, it's a good card. And they, they do put good cards together, don't they? And, and this looks pretty good. Yeah, it's just good matchmaking. Like once you actually look and delve into them and watch the fighters and, and do a bit of research and do a bit of study, you're like, oh man, these, these fights are actually squared up real well. Like uh, the matchmakers do a real good job, job of matching styles for exciting fights. So I've done my research as well. I've I've actually gone back and watched tape of these fighters. So, oh, yeah. Okay. So I've okay. developed some opinions, but I'm loath to give them. But uh, we'll have a bit of discussion. Then. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Raoni Barcelos, a Brazilian, takes on a Russian, uh, Said Nurmagomedovov. Which is the same, <laughs> <laughs> which is the same as Khabib. No if, relation. Though. No relation though. Uh, thirteen and one versus uh, thirteen and one. So very similar um, fight records. These mm-hmm. guys. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like Barcelos. He's got good short counter punches, like really powerful from short range. Man, uh, you learn some things. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, 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 I've, yeah, I've been watching, and whereas I was expecting when I watched the Russian to see sort of a traditional type fight, but he's flashy. He loves the he, spinning fist. Yeah, and, he's a good he's a good striker for a Russian. Mm. You know, generally, <laughs> they are kind of like Khabib, and they're pressure wrestlers, and they, you know they just have enough striking to get the job done. But no, he's he's very class act on the feet. Uh, this is just a striker versus striker matchup. Uh, except one's a boxer. Barcelos is the boxer. He's a forward pressure fighter. And then Nurmagomedov is a is more of a kicking based striker. So you, then you've got a kicker versus a boxer. Uh, I'm going to lean towards Barcelos in this one because of his size um, and, and just his power with his hands. Is 54% of his wins are via knockout, whereas Nurmagomedov, the Russian, 54% of his wins are via decision. And he's moving up from flyweight as well. So he's uh, spent majority of his career at flyweight. And now he's had one fight up at bantamweight. He had some uh, good success in his last matchup uh, at the bantamweight division. But I feel like Barcelos is just going to carry too much power for him. And, and kind of be able to dictate where the fight takes place. So I think Nurmagomedov uh, would do a good job early, but but that power advantage will take advantage. Uh, I think he just controls the fight. I don't think Nurmagomedov gets knocked out. I just feel like Basalos controls the fight with his power and his size. Win by decision to Basalos? Mm. That's what I had as well. Uh, one for one, let's go. Um, Wally Alves, uh, a Brazilian uh, ultimate fighter winner, uh, Brazil <laughs> Uh, about four years ago, he looks quite classy up against uh, Sergio Moray. Uh, he's coming off a loss um, eight weeks ago, so a fairly quick turnaround for the uh, jiu-jitsu black belter. Yeah, so two uh, jiu-jitsu black belts, two grappler. This is a open with a striker versus striker. This is a grappler versus grappler. Um, most of LV's submissions are from... The, the one submission, and that's a guillotine choke, which he seems to jump on everyone. He even snatched uh, Colby Covington. He got him with the guillotine choke early on in his career. His form as of late has not been has not been that impressive, whereas Marias, even though he's, he's you know had mixed results, I believe um, two wins, two losses, or two wins, three losses in his last five fights, he, he's looked good even in those losses. Um in this fight, I'm going to have to lean towards Marias because he's the better top game fighter in the jiu-jitsu, whereas Alves has used his jiu-jitsu more defensively and, and counter jiu-jitsu, whereas Marias is really uh, uh, dominant, and he's he's done very well dominating other black belts. He fought Ben Saunders and, and just was a class act on him. He was all over him, dominated him, passed his guard, um, and got a submission very early in that fight. So, yeah, I'm leaning towards uh, Marias for a submission. Next one, and it sort of makes me sad to say BJ Penn's getting in the cage again. I mean, he's 40 years old. He hasn't won a fight for eight and a half years, uh, six losses back-to-back. Um, he is taking on a 37-year-old in Clay Guida. He, he's three and three in his last six fights. But why does BJ Penn keep jumping in? Well, in this one... 
I can understand this fight. I didn't like him when they matched him up against, you know, their young prospects like Yaya Rodriguez. When I kind of seen that fight, I was like, oh, I don't want to watch this. Mm. I don't want to watch, like, one of the legends of the sport. If I'm going to watch one of the legends of the sport, I want to watch him fight another older legend guy who's on the tail end of his career. And this is Clay Guida, you know. Um, even though Clay Guida is still fairly competitive against the newer guys upstarts uh, in the division, yeah. Three and three, still fighting and competing against very tough and stiff competition. But yeah, BJ is not the same BJ that we have um, are used to seeing. He he's his game is a bit stuck in the past and it's a bit stuck in the mud where he keeps things very separate. He either boxes or he, you know, tries to throw submissions up off of his back. I'm edging this towards Clay Guida in this fight. He's he's always comes in shape. His conditioning is second to none, and BJ's conditioning over the last years has really faulted him. So I feel like Guida pressures forwards, pressures him against the cage, takes him down, uh, avoids him trying to submit him off his back, and picks up the decision. Then we go into the women's bantamweight, uh, the number 10 ranked Irene as Dana against the number 12, <laughs> Beth Correa. Um, height and reach advantage to as Dana. Last four have all gone the distance for her, winning her last two. Uh, most recently, UFC 228. Um, Beth Correa, last UFC fight loss was to Holly Holm, and that's, you know, that's no no disrespect because Holly Holm's handy. And that was a, I think there was a head kick that she went down to in that one. So fairly evenly matched these two. Yeah, Correa's... Um I think she's most recognisable <clears throat> from getting knocked out in 30 seconds by Ronda Rousey mm. and then getting her head kicked off by Holly Holm. So that's not, <laughs> those are not memories that we want to shoot to people's minds. Uh, 80% of her wins are via decision. She's got 20% um, knockouts, but she's a striker. Beth Cohea, uh, Aldana, 56% of her wins are via knockout. So she's also a striker, but she carries a little bit more power than Kohira. Uh, four and a half inch reach advantage coming into this matchup. And just going and watching them, um, Aldana has great footwork. And defensively, she's very slick, whereas Kohira is just a very rudimental. I wouldn't even call her a... There's a difference between a boxer and a puncher. Mm. Uh, boxer has a bit more tactic and a bit more class. Bit more I would, uh, Yeah, I would put... Beth Cohea in the puncher. You know, she punches very well, but she's definitely not a boxer, whereas Aldana is a, is a boxer. Very slick defensively, very good footwork, whereas Cohea just kind of likes to plod forwards, plod forwards, plod forwards, swing punches. I think Aldana picks her apart at range, dodges those counter shots, uh, exits out with her great footwork and, and resets and does it all over again and kind of cruises to a decision in this one. Then uh, Thiago Moises, 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 against Kurt Hollabau. Um, I didn't have time to research these two guys, <laughs> so I'm leaving it to you. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, this is a good fight. Um, two young prospects coming into this. Hollabau has had a terrible start to his UFC. He's a good fighter. He's a good fighter from good um, caliber. He's uh, competed at some very good shows leading into the UFC, but he's 0-2 in the UFC, one via armbar loss, and then one, oh, he was knocked out by Barcelos, who's in our first fight of the night. Uh, if someone can remember this fight, he hit him with like three uppercuts in a row. He hit him with like three super uppercuts in a row and, and knocked Halabau out. So bad start to a good fighter. You know, he definitely has some potential. Uh, Moises... 0-1 in the UFC, but the kind of competition he was against <clears> in that fight was Benil Dariush, who's um, one of the perennial contenders in the UFC's lightweight division, and he took him very seriously. He didn't uh, kind of take his head off or, or go to go to get him out of there. He he just really took no risks, and he pressed him against the cage, and he, he just he's a very good black belt, and he managed to outgrapple him over the course of 15 minutes. Uh, so... But Neil had a lot of respect for Moises coming into this one. I feel like Moises is just the cleaner fighter of the two. Hollow Bell's a bit 
bull in a china shop for me and he, he tries to take guys' heads off. And You like the technicians, eh? I love the technicians. I love the technicians because in, in the long run, at the end of the day, like over time, the technicians always win. The bull in the china shops, they're, they're like a flash in the pan. They're good for a couple of shows. They're good for a couple of years. <laughs> then you never see them again. But the technicians will consistently come up over five years, over 10 years, over 15 years. You're going to see these guys and follow these guys. Uh, so I'm definitely going to side with Moises coming into this one. I feel like he's just the more clinical grappler of the two, and he gets the job done via submission. Submission. Uh, Antonio Naguera against he, he's 42 years old with a record of 22 and eight. Ryan Span <coughs> called Superman, and he's even got the Superman tattoo on his chest. 27 years old on a five fight win streak. He's an up and comer. Yeah, so Span he's uh, 60. percent 67% of his wins are via submission, so he's a submission guy. Six foot five, which is uh, incredible. He has a six inch reach advantage coming into this one, and he's 15 years younger. <laughs> wow. But Little Nog is a legend of the game. Uh, he's only fought once since 2016, and that was a knockout win over Sam Alvey, smiling Sam Alvey. Little Dog has never lost a fight via submission. He's never been submitted. They're two, uh, him and his brother, are very proud. They will, they will, there's a big Nog. He was like stuck in a arm, arm lock by Frank Mir and he was just looking at it <laughs> and he watched him snap it because there's like too much pride to tap because these guys are such well-respected grapplers in the community. Uh, <laughs> in the grappling community, this made me wince. He had too much pride to tap. It was it was quite painful to watch. He was he was stuck in the arm lock, and he was just looking at him, and he knew it was going to break. And he he watched him. He waited for it to break. He broke it, and then he tapped because it's a ridiculous amount of pride. <laughs> so even though Span has all these things stacked against Little Nog, uh, it's very hard to bet against one of the Nogueira brothers on home soil. In Brazil, I just feel like he's he's going to weather that early storm from Span. He just slowly pushes the pressure on, and uh, I feel like he he takes that tail end of that fight uh, in fairly dominant fashion, and he takes the decision. How much of an advantage is it that Little Nog's been in with the likes of Alistair Overeem, Ryan Bader twice, uh, Tito Ortiz? He's been in with the best. Yeah, he has been in the, the best, and that's just something you know in the back of your mind that you've been through wars like that, you've been through tougher fights, and that even if this guy's pouring it on you or he hurts you early or something like that, um, you've just been through so much more against higher caliber of fighter, and so you know you can weather that storm. Then we've got um, a really evenly matched one here. These two guys, similar KO, submission, decision percentages. This is Francisco Trinaldo, the Brazilian, against another Brazilian, Diego Ferreira. Uh, Trinaldo's gone win-loss, win-loss, win. Um, and Ferreira's probably one of the most active fighters in UFC. This is his fourth camp in 12 months, so you'd like that too. Yeah, well, well he's had his fourth because he had two years off because he was suspended for steroids, mm. so... No, I don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> no, you like his activity, <laughs> but not his outside boxing activity. <laughs> uh, for Hera, yeah, he's kind of turned into a bit of a striker as of late, but he's a he's a grappler, whereas Trinaldo, he is a striker, and he's one of the, the top strikers in the lightweight division, and he's just been a stalwart in the, in the lightweight division. And his only real thing that stopped him from cracking into the top 10 or top 5 is the opportunity whereas guys like don't want to fight him because he's a very powerful southpaw striker very awkward and um, very very hard to beat and he's only lost you know the likes of James Vick and things like this uh, he's got more experience than Ferreira he's had 18 UFC fights whereas Ferreira's only had 8 so he's got 10 more UFC fights in the bag against stiffer competition I just feel like Trinaldo's the more polished striker of the two um, for here is not going to be able to get him down and Trinado will pick him apart on the feet and I'm actually pegging him to stop him later in the fight he's the dollar sixty favorite Trinado in that one um, Tiago Alves got a heap of experience um, price wise this fight he's, he's up against Loriano Staropoli um, but Alves returned to the winner's circle beating Griffin in February um, it was a welcome return to a to winning because his career was a bit 50-50 there. Yeah, well, he's a former title challenger. I believe he um, 
challenged George St. Pierre for the title uh, a few years ago. Yeah, 25 UFC fights, 15 wins, 10 losses. Uh, striker, 57% of his wins are via knockout. But yeah, two wins, four losses in his last six fights. Stropoli, one UFC fight. He's 1-0 in the UFC. So when you're <laughs> coming in with uh, one fight against uh, 25 fights, that's a that's a lot of experience to kind of come up against. And it wasn't until I watched Stropoli fight and I did a bit of research and watched his fights that it made it very clear who I think I'm going to decide to choose because Alves <laughs> is one of the best low kickers in the game. And uh, Stropoli, in his last fight against Hector Aldana, he was getting hit with a lot of low kicks and he was not really addressing that. He wasn't checking it. He wasn't moving out of the way. He wasn't countering it. He was kind of just eating them. And that's against like a lower tier striker. So now he's finding one of the most experienced guys, one of the best low kickers in the sport of MMA. And he doesn't address that low kick. I feel like Alves is going to take his leg off and actually stop him. That'll be a TKO. That'll be a TKO. Then we've got uh, one of the greats, Jose Aldo. We talked about um, past fights for some of the, the previous fighters. This guy's been in with McGregor, Edgar, um, actually Holloway twice. Um, he's had two wins since a, a couple of losses, Jose Aldo. Uh, he is a slight favourite against an Australian. We've talked about win streaks. 16-fight win streak mm. for Alexander Volkanovsky, uh, the Aussie. He's the slight underdog. Last loss six years ago. Yeah, he's training with us at the moment. He's training with us at uh, excellent at City Kickbox inside. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mm. so I've been in the gym with him, uh, training every day. He's training very hard, and uh, he's just a different kind of pressure. And more in this fight is the momentum that he kind of has behind him. I've never, you know, just the, the hunger that he has as a fighter, and you can see that in his last fight against Chad Mendes. Like he was rocking Chad Mendes. He just took the fight to Chad, and he just made Chad quit. And then even after that fight, Chad retired because he was just like, it was very clear to him after that fight that he just didn't have a heart for it anymore. Even though the skill is there, you know, the skill level was either, uh, even against Volk and Chad. It just came down to who wanted it more. And he he showed Mendes that he's just hungry. He's a hungry young lion, and he's coming for these legends. Uh, Aldo, he's a striker. Very good takedown defense. Um, I would class him as a striker. I would class Volkanovski as a wrestler. Uh, he likes to come out, throw some very heavy hands, but he's also he's constantly shooting him for the takedown. But it's not really to hold a guy down. He just likes to pressure, and he just likes to make you tired. He just really likes to put a pace on a guy that just breaks him. And I feel like Aldo's not going to be able to handle the kind of pressure that Volkanovski brings to the table. You know, he's going to come out, get in his face, stay in his face, shoot him for the takedowns. I feel like Aldo's going to scramble back up to his feet every single time like he does against anyway. But Volkanovski doesn't care. He's going to repeat the same process and he's in the best shape I've ever seen him in. So, uh, I'm picking Volkanovski to stop him in the later rounds. Wow. Shocked. Heard around the world. Jose Aldo <laughs> picks up another loss. Um, <clears throat> and then a guy that, well, we love. Everyone loves Anderson Silva. Mm -mm. Um, he's an underdog again. He's only had one win in his last oh, seven what? fights. He's the underdog in this fight. He's the underdog in this fight. Come off. You don't like that? Come off. <laughs> one win in his last seven fights. Um, and Jared... Jared Cannonier. Yeah. He beat David Branch in uh, UFC 230 in November, <coughs> having come off two losses. And I think I remember, does my memory serve me right, that you said David Branch is one of your favourite fighters to watch? Uh, Would you have said that? No, nah, I don't think so. Okay. He's good to watch, but he's only, <laughs> yeah, he hasn't been in the UFC that long. Anyway, <laughs> Cannonier, four and four. UFC record, so he was fighting up at light heavyweight, and then that David Branch fight, I believe he took it on short notice. Yeah, he took it on short notice down at middleweight. Um, so for him to change weight class on short notice is quite uh, unusual. He's a big, strong striker, but I feel like he's just been handpicked for Anderson Silva. Uh, yeah, I I don't understand why he's the favorite. Look, he's an incredibly strong striker. He's a big, powerful guy. He's an imposing figure. 
uh, very muscular, very strong, very very in good, very uh, very good shape. But Anderson does very good against these guys, these imposing figures, because you know the more muscle you have, the slower you are, and the easier to read you are. And from what I've seen in the Israel Adesanya fight, was Anderson Silva is still a very high level striker. Uh, we all know how good Israel is. And he did not take Anderson lightly. And that was a very good fight. That was a very competitive, even contest. I just feel like a guy like Cannonier has been handpicked by Anderson Silva's management team. Um, he make, needs a win, doesn't to he? To make him look good. He needs, he a, needs win. a win. And I feel like he's going to pick one up fairly easy. Uh, he's going to be able to read Cannonier pretty early on in this fight, avoid his big power strikes. I feel like he's just too slow and too muscle bound for him. Anderson Silva picks him apart and cruises to a decision. Yoo-hoo. We love an underdog. Tip. Underdog. Come underdog. On. I got a feeling you might go underdog here as well because uh, Rose Namajanis is the underdog <sighs> against Jessica Andraj. Um, interestingly, it's going to be a good night. <laughs> It's going to be a good afternoon for the bank account. They've both, fought, they've both fought um, Joanna <coughs> Yeah. Uh Jessica Andraj has lost to her, and Nama Janis has beaten her twice. Mm, mm. It's a bit hard to stick to MMA math, though, just stylistically wise. Like. <laughs> <laughs> just, just look at it in isolation. <laughs> yeah, you, you really have to just, um, yeah, you have to match up the styles. Like, they're, they're, Yoani and Jacek and then Rose Namajunas are completely different styles. And um, look, Andrade is a big, powerful striker, big, powerful boxer. She's coming over this incredible knockout over Carolina Kovalkiewicz. Uh, first round, knocked her out, took her head off. And in the women's strawweight division, that's incredibly unusual. So it surprised a lot of people. Uh, she's on a three-fight win streak. Claudia Gadelia, Tisha Torres, and yeah. Carolina Kovalkiewicz. Um, Rose, also a, a three-fight win streak over Michelle Watterson, and then two wins over Ioanni and Jacek, one via KO, and then one via decision. Andrade is a very strong puncher, and she's very dangerous if you stand in front of her like Carolina Kovalkiewicz did. She stood in front of her, and she exchanged punches with her. Um, that's where Andrade is most dangerous, but I can't remember a, in recent memory a fight where Rose Namajunas stood in front of someone and just wildly exchanged punches with them. She does very well to turning, turning it more into a fencing match than a fist fight. She won't stand there and exchange with you because that's not where her skill set relies. She has a very good jab to keep fighters on the outside, and she has incredible footwork. Um probably the best footwork in the entire division. So she'll just pick her off from range and just reset and start again, whereas Andrade will get very frustrated over the course of the fight. So I just feel like stylistically wise, this is not a fight that Andrade will excel at. I feel like this is stylistically built for Rose number Yunus to pick her off at range, reset, and cruise to another decision. I feel like it's going to look very similar to the last fight with Yunus. You, uh, Joanna and Jacek, where she just picked her off and reset, picked her off and reset. Fencing match, not a fist fight. <laughs> UFC must love Rose. Uh, um, she's had eleven career fights, and this is her fifth pay per view UFC. She obviously draws the crowds. Yeah, she must be taking the numbers or, or making the needle move behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's all about. And lastly, before we head off, um, you've got a date. Well, you, I can't say that. Well, you, oh, you can't? <laughs> well, you know you've got a fight coming up, but you don't know where and you don't know who. I don't I don't know who, I don't know where, but I know I have one. You so know I'm you. a very happy man. In the next I'm three content. months, Dan Hooker will be back in the octagon. But can't tell you where and we can't tell you when. But we yeah. will when we find out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know when I know. Okay, thanks, Dan. <laughs>